This is the latest real-time data that our Nettlexer Intelligence Lab has been collecting, and we are thrilled to share with you all some of the positive updates we have been seeing. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our sixth Retail E-Commerce COVID-19 Updates webinar. My name is Heather Desette, and I'm Nettlexer's Event Marketing Manager. Before we dive into the data, I quickly wanted to go through today's agenda and share with you a little bit about who we are. So to begin, who is Nettlexer? At Nettlexer, we help retail brands find and engage high value customers. We do so through an array of our digital marketing solutions that are listed here. The real-time data in today's presentation is powered by our proprietary tool, LXR Insights. Feel free to request a demo in your survey to see how today's data was collected. Nettlexer is proud to be premier partners with UPS, Google, Microsoft Bing, and Facebook. And on the previous screen, you could see the amazing clients that we have the privilege of working with. Um, as you can see, their industries vary from food to fashion. All right, again, if you have any questions dur during the presentation, don't hesitate to submit them via the chat box or the Q&A button. Also, if you're more comfortable discussing offline, you can email us at any time at shareinsights at netelixir.com or submit your questions in the quick survey that will appear on your screen once the presentation concludes. We have allotted plenty of time at the end of the presentation to answer as many of your questions as we can. All right, so let me introduce today's speakers. Today's presentation focuses on the road to recovery, lessons from mid-sized retailers, and we are thrilled to be joined by three retail executives from very different industries. During our roundtable discussion, you'll hear from Lee Kantz, who is the Director of Direct-to-Consumer of E-Commerce at Itsy Ritzy, joining us all the way from Oak Park, Illinois. Aaron Palander, the Vice President of Marketing at GovX, joining us from sunny San Diego, California. Ruth Jeffers, the CEO of Jeffers Pets, joining us from Dothan, Alabama. And the roundtable discussion will be moderated by our very own Eudane Bose, who is the CEO and founder of Nettlexer, joining us all the way from Princeton, New Jersey. To begin, Eudane is going to review the outbreak's impact on shopper behavior and retail e-commerce and discuss our key observations from the data collected from May 17th to June 13th for today's presentation. To go over the data surrounding the outbreak, I am pleased to welcome Nettlexer's founder and CEO, Eudane Bose. Eudane, over to you. Hi, Heather, thank you very much. And a big thank you to Ruth, uh, Aaron, and Lee for sort of joining us for this roundtable discussion. Uh, it has been a fascinating last three months. We started the first of the COVID-19 series way back in, on mid-March 11th, and this is the sixth one, as uh, Heather mentioned. And I uh, have started each one of these presentations uh, with this slide. Uh, we very humbly acknowledge that this is, I think, first, first and foremost, a big and huge human tragedy of absolutely epic proportions with really lives at risk. We really hope that the continue, conditions continue to improve quickly. We are seeing uh, very positive signs, at least in the Northeast, but there are certain other parts of the country which uh, definitely the, the, the overall number of cases have still been on the rise. Uh, I really wish all of you stay safe and stay well. Uh, the, the outbreak is moving quickly as well. So I mean, a lot of these, a uh, lot, lot of my, the, the initial part of the presentation is about the real time data, but you can get only so much real time. So the data that we have aggregated is still about midnight Eastern of June 13th. And we have really compartmentalized the entire slot into about two week periods each. And uh, we continue to closely track the data. And uh, those of you who really are interested in really understanding the real time impact uh, of, uh, of the coronavirus uh, and the recovery now, uh, please please subscribe to our blog, netflix.com slash blog for weekly updates. Uh, I'll start with a quick research overview. Uh, so now uh, it has been it has been a little over three months since we have done this. Uh, we really compartmentalize the data as I mentioned in about nine now overall nine different uh, fourteen day periods as such, and the data pertains to about seven different categories. Uh, the the categories are apparel, home decor, tools and hardware, food, gifting, pet supplies, and home furnishing, and we have really compared. Uh, the daily to, uh, the daily data 2020 to 2019 for each one of these nine periods as such. And as Heather mentioned, we have really used our proprietary technology platform, Alexa Insights, to go ahead and uh, do a lot of this data analysis. So without, uh, also if those of you are interested in looking at and reviewing some of the past data, uh, because there is, a, there is a lot of information there, there are a lot of insights there, which can be really helpful. 
uh, you can use this uh, use this link netflix.com slash covid hash tag nine uh, basically uh, dash 19 uh, to really download and view all of the webinars since 11th of march for today i my my initial section is just going to be very short it's just about four or five slides and what i really wanted to focus on is uh, the e-commerce data and the online shopper insights and after that as i mentioned we have we three wonderful uh, client guests joining us all of them retailers from different categories and we'll get into a roundtable discussion or panel discussion now this is how online sales are really growing and they really continue to grow at an explosive pace across categories uh, as you can see each and every category and these are like year on year increase in online sales last year versus this year and we have broken it down into two week period time frames uh, as you can see apparel started on a slightly slow note but uh, once the stimulus checks were received roughly around the mid of april we saw the apparel started showing those positive year on year trends uh, it has been still fluctuating i mean it sort of went up to uh, as much as about 25 percent year on year growth subsided a little bit over the last couple of weeks and so on it has been off and on but we feel fairly positive that this apparel over the next couple of months would see a very robust growth trend uh, food uh, really was the one which grew at a absolutely a blockbuster pace to get up the door i mean uh, as you can see 22nd of march to 4th april that period have about 590 percent year on year growth incredible numbers that continues though understandably the year on year growth has come down a little bit but it is still anywhere between 184 107 percent so on an average about 150 percent year on year growth uh, in terms of online sales uh, in the food category is still very much uh, very much happening uh, gifting uh, very interestingly so when we had started uh, i believe i had mentioned it during the our second webinar that we saw a huge spike in the uh, in the overall the greetings as well as uh, uh, faith-based products uh, uh, basically gifting of faith-based products and so on and uh, this was the time around again 22nd of march to 4th of april where we saw a massive spike happen uh, in essentially uh, the, the entire gifting category and that really continues home furnishings is something which really picked up again to an extent can be correlated with the stimulus checks but if you look at from middle of april april 57 percent moved up to 112 percent and currently at about 150 to 130 percent year on year growth now i think all of us would appreciate i mean from those of us who are basically from the retail industry and really have a significant online sales presence that these are some absolutely abnormally high numbers but uh, we are continually seeing the the positive trend continue of those triple digit percentage growth now i can really go on and on but i think home home decor pet supplies every category tools and hardware every everywhere we are seeing a substantial growth in terms of online sales and uh, what uh, uh, some of you may already have really been able to review and do a little bit of your own analysis but i wanted to share with you uh, the retail data uh, as we know that uh, it was published yesterday yesterday uh, uh, by uh, the, the us government this is the census data which comes out the retail data now very interestingly i uh, what i have tried to do is i try to sort of break it down into about five different columns so jan feb march april may and uh, about five or four or five rows the first row shows uh, and we have taken that field which is uh, which pertains to the, the electronic shopping and the mail order houses and as you can see january of this year was about 61 billion dollars in terms of e-commerce sales now again it's like e-commerce plus mail order houses but i'm just focusing almost like trying to get a like to like comparison since we don't have the exact numbers reported by the government so 61 billion dollars versus 55.5 billion dollars last year jan so it was a growth of about 10 percent or more importantly there were about four and a half roughly about five billion dollars extra sale which happened jan this year compared to last year in the month of feb again a very similar trend 56 billion dollars last year went up to 61 that number suddenly spiked to 65 billion dollars in march a growth of 16.6 percent increased further to 70.5 billion dollars and most recently the, the numbers which came out yesterday shows that 81.2 billion dollars happened online now if you really look at that number look at the look at the jan number or let us say even the february number as such 61 billion dollars becomes 81 billion dollars 20 billion dollars additional sales got really added in in a span of these three months 
20 billion dollars accounts for if you really look at 61 billion dollars as a base is one third incremental sales volume addition now understandably with such a huge huge growth understandably there was a lot of logistical supply chain problems which still in certain cases have been uh, mitigated substantially but still initially the month of march and april i think there were like massive massive sort of almost like supply chain disruptions which really hit, hit each and every retailer so if you really look at this of so 5.5 billion dollars was added at that point in time in feb it was 5.4 billion dollars 9.3 billion dollars 13.3 and most recently in the month of may 22.5 billion dollars compared to what may of 2019 was a huge incremental addition overall in terms of sales now if you're able to compare that with uh, the, the fourth row out here which is the total retail sales in 2020 you would see that in jan the total retail sales was about 381.5 billion dollars uh, that sort of held more or less steady came down in march came down quite dramatically in the month of april and again sort of went back up to 357 but 357 as you can see is still lower compared to what Jan and Feb were, right? So there is a so what what it really conveys is there is think of the amount of pent up demand which is there. Let us for a moment take three hundred eighty billion dollars as a frame of reference. That's overall the the overall retail volume sales, excluding the motor motor part basically motor vehicle parts and gasoline stations. So three eighty billion dollars my minus minus three hundred eighteen billion dollars is about sixty two billion dollars of pent up sale happened only in the month of April. If you look at the month of March, about $9 billion pent up sale. So 62 plus nine uh, was rough, roughly about uh, $71 billion. Again, if you really look at the month of May, it is still lower. It is still $23 billion lower. So all of this is pent up. It, it's almost like a pent up spending capacity, which is there. Now, understandably, we are seeing a, seeing a lift but then let us, let us look at as to where this lift from 318 to 357 is happening. And that is happening online, right? Because online share of the overall retail sales has gone up. It has gone up from 22.2% in April to about 22.7%. So that should give you an understanding that what we are experiencing in online retail is nothing less than a gold rush. And this is, this is again, based on, I'll share with you a couple of stats. This is, our, our forecast is this will continue. And why will it continue? Let me explain that. So this is our projection. We believe that June will sort of ended about 23% of total US retail sales. A slight increase from 22.7%, but we'll sort of move up because that's where the trends are. So what is happening here? So there are a couple of trends. And if you do the analysis, sort of dive down a little bit more or, or a little deeper, you will see that the percentage increase in new shopper revenue, very interesting. New shopper revenue is a great barometer because these are the new to file online customers which, which are being acquired by a retailer, right? If you really look at each and every case, hardware and tools, the year-on-year -year increase has been about 100% uh, plus, pet supplies, 100% plus, home furnishings. So all of these categories, the lowest was in apparel, at least in our data set, and that itself was more than 40%. So the online shopper-led revenue or new online shopper-led revenue remains very, very strong still. The second part, this is just a couple of categories, but across categories, the conversion rates are still very strong. Now, albeit in the month of April and probably the first half of May, we saw lesser number of advertisers competing uh, for, for certain keywords. We do a huge amount of uh, search marketing and paid social advertising and Amazon ads. And we saw a fewer number of advertisers competing in uh, till about mid of May, but mid of May onwards, the number of advertisers has gone up, which has led to the, the cost per click increasing as well. But at the same time, the conversion rates have held, held more or less steady. What does this mean? It means that essentially the, the probability of a visitor converting into a customer has in for most cases doubled in certain cases probably has gone up as much as about five times. And that's a massive trend. That is a massive trend which is out there. So the new shoppers, and this is, I think I'm just trying to summarize all of our uh, research inside. They are purchasing faster and across categories, they are anywhere between 18 to 27% faster than the pre-pandemic shopper. What does it mean? That first time a new visitor is landing on the website until the time she is completing a purchase, she is taking 18% to 20%, 27% lesser time. So she is completing her purchase quicker between the first landing and the purchase. The second is she's purchasing more frequently as well, right? So 
the new shopper we had expected and in fact my second presentation i have mentioned that we'll see as to whether the new new to file online shoppers they continue to shop with a particular brand or once the stores reopen they sort of go back right so we have very conclusive proof that a significant chunk of these new shoppers which are being acquired by e-commerce merchants they are continuing to shop with those brands which is a fundamentally a massive massive trend or an insight which is sort of going on so 30% more purchase instances compared to pre pandemic shopper so pre pandemic the shopper uh, were not really the, the new shoppers didn't shop as frequently the new shoppers that we are acquiring at this point in time over the last 3 months or so they have been sort of purchasing more frequently so more purchase instances 30% more purchase instances and the third one is spending more per purchase as well so not only are these new shoppers spending more frequently that but they are spending more as well uh, 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 essentially per purchase occasion so all of these three are very strong positive trends which really uh, which really force us to ask a fundamental question has this pandemic altered shopper behavior permanently and our answer at this point in time though again we don't really want to have, have any very clear concluding statement because unfortunately the pandemic still continues and i think uh, the stores are still reopening and i think we'll see as to in the long run how it pans out but at this point in time netflix's answer at this point in our research lab answer is most likely yes and today in fact uh, the uh, e marketer also came up with a very interesting uh, interesting uh, piece of insight uh, this is this they they mapped the the increase in the percentage of the the us digital buyers who were aged 45 plus and they believe in the last 3 uh, months or the basically this quarter they believe that already about 5 million new to online shoppers have been added only in the 45 plus category and if you really look at across the different age groups so all age groups they believe 7.4 million new digital buyers have been added in 2020 already that is a massive number right there that is a massive transformative number right there which i think uh, can can completely alter as to how the retail retail sales are done uh, uh, moving in the future and probably even now so i think that i i still stick to that statement lot of you i got a huge number of emails linkedin messages uh, on this statement that i had made i still stick to that if your e-commerce business is not growing at this point in time at 100% year on year or more you probably are losing market share isn't that incredible i mean at triple digit percentages growth there is a likelihood that you are still losing market share because the overall space is exploding uh some of the questions and i'll probably just sort of end my first part because i really want to uh, get into a conversation and get the get the feedback from three of our guest executives who have sort of joined us today uh, but some of the questions i'll just place it there and sort of let you reflect on it first is how much demand can the e-commerce retailers really manage without breaking their supply chain and e-commerce infrastructure do they really have the resources technology and partner ecosystem to manage this rapid scale up and rapid scale up i have already showed the government data uh, i mean 20 billion dollar getting added in a span of probably about 3 or 4 months that is indeed rapid scale up so i think under unless and until there is an infrastructure which is completely created supporting this uh, the supply chain disruptions etc are likely to happen uh, if you are unable to really create a partnership ecosystem which helps you grab a big share of this demand then you probably are not really doing justice you are probably actually losing market share the second question which i think fundamentally many of our many of us and i know we have quite a few of our, our analyst friends joining today uh, on our webinar as well what percentage of total retail sales will e-commerce finally settle down at i mean when let us say by the end of this year right would it be 20% would it be 25% or would it be higher than 25% now again uh, one of the things that we are seeing very clearly first hand is the habits are getting formed and the question is will the habits once they have been formed and ingrained will they get broken and will people get back to what they were used to earlier uh, only time will tell but at this point in time we are we are leaning towards probably not how should omni channel retailers rethink their business model to adapt to this new normal a very important question because 
in most cases let us talk about an omni channel retailer about 70 75% of their sales happened from retail stores and 25% or 30% happened from online right now suddenly that has been flipped right so essentially everything from their operating infrastructure from their warehousing system from their supply chain and logistics infrastructure from their financing systems from their attribution of the profit margins etc everything really has to be rethought of our retailers at this point in time and i know we have many retailers joining us today on this call are you really rethinking your business model how exactly can you scale up and really participate in this so called i use the word again gold rush which is going on at this point in time my last question is how big of an impact will the new shoppers really have for you during the upcoming holidays my personal opinion on this thing they'll have a massive impact so the new shoppers that you are sort of winning today and if you really treat them well and if you really are able to build that that overall customer loyalty i would probably place a bet that they would be your major business driver or revenue driver essentially once you get to the holiday season so again think of these questions with that i really want to sort of move on to the 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 second part of the conversation where i would sort of love to have uh, all of all of the all of the panelists uh, uh, to sort of introduce to you to all of the panelists so we have uh, ruth jeffers ceo of jeffers fred sort of joining us hi ruth uh, uh, and we sort of get to the introduction we have aaron pelander from gavex joining us from san diego hey aaron and we have lee cans from uh, it's it it's joining us from illinois so this is the entire group uh, it's absolutely a privilege and fantastic great joy having all of you here looking forward to a great conversation but before we move on to the the discussion uh, uh, ruth would you want to just start with a quick introduction and then we can really move on to aaron and then to lee okay um i'm ruth jeffers i am the ceo of jefferspet.com and also um marketing has always been i've always been a data geek and love numbers and super excited to be a part of this because we've seen a lot of challenges and the day and um the challenges that you asked us to kind of go over do you want us to do that now or come back to us after you introduce yeah let us do a quick round of introduction and then we sort of start with the, i have a particular slide on that so i'll move on to that okay sounds so, good aaron do you want to go next yeah hi everyone my name is aaron palander um vice president of marketing at govex and i've been with uh govex for about six years and i've been we've been with net elixir for about three years uh, for about half my time and our primary website is govex.com uh, we are online only and we cater to current and former military uh, law enforcement firefighters other first responders and government employees uh, we are a member membership based site uh, which is free but you have to verify that you did or do one of those jobs and then once you're on the site you have access to great discounts from hundreds of top brands and in different times pro sports teams and universities and other other forms of entertainment thank you Alan. Do, you, do you want to sort of do a quick introduction yeah sure i'm lee Kantz. i head up direct to consumer e-commerce at itsy ritzy we're a producer of products for new parents and their children. We sell a lot of diaper bags, feeding, teething, nursing products. Uh, I've been with the company since a year ago, January. Uh, it's my second gig in a Shopify Plus environment. Uh, and uh, I helped them grow their e-commerce last year and I'm helping to lead the gold rush this year. Um, I have uh, over 30 years of experience uh, in digital uh, internet going all the way back to 93 and even CD-ROM publishing before then. So, uh, but uh, it's great to be here. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you. Welcome again, everyone. So let us just dive into the questions first. And I just start with probably Ruth again. Uh, Ruth, I think that the COVID-19 outbreak really has disrupted our daily lives. I think in personally, professionally, I think office-wise, remote working, I think a, a lot really has changed. I, I would love to know what are some of the changes that you have had to deal with so far? And uh, how exactly have you dealt with these challenges? Well, and, um, this has been an unbelievably crazy time, both personally, professionally, the challenge of, um, if you fast forward back to March 16th, good friend of mine said, hey, 
they're going to start shutting down businesses and you need to make sure you're ready for this and you need to get uh, waivers being an essential business. And um, I was trying to understand it. I was like, that's crazy. So I was up most of the night talking to local folks saying, hey, we need an essential waiver. Fast forward the next day, um, tell folks at work I'll be back in an hour. Um, and it turned out my son was diagnosed with type 1 um, diabetes and an autoimmune disease and still trying to figure the whole world you know the world is about to change but you don't know how and literally in the doctor's office and i said can you hold on a second i'm stuck talking to the state um, director of agriculture in alabama and he said don't you need to go are they sending you to the hospital and i said yes but don't hang up i'll be right back and so the beginning of this started off in that and so the biggest disruption to begin with was the transition of getting folks that had never worked from home to working from home and having to really lead that and encourage that um, myself working from the hospital in the beginning. Um, the second biggest challenge we had were back orders and had a lot of vendors that were out of shut down um, because they were not deemed essential or because they didn't have the raw materials. And we're still seeing some of the impacts of that where some of the supply chains are disrupted, which increases our shipping costs because where you might ship one package for one order, then suddenly you're shipping two packages per order because you're shipping the main order and then the item that's back ordered. So we saw a, a huge increase in the number of packages because of the number of back orders that were shipped. And the other thing that really was a huge challenge for us was curbside delivery and continues for our local retail outlet to be a big challenge for us since we're so much e-commerce focused and we've always done a great job in retail, but it's been you know, kind of an afterthought and trying to work out that curbside delivery. So those have really been the three mm. biggest challenges. And the way we've dealt with all of them is just like we always do. We sit down, pick it apart and, okay, what do we do next? And what does, you know, what does it look like when we grow up a week from now? So. Mm. Excellent. Thank you, Ruth. Lee, you want to sort of add in? Add in, Lee? Um, I'll go. Um, I think one of the challenges, a lot of the personal challenges, I think, are mixed in with the professional challenges, just like Ruth, uh, uh, just missing my coworkers. I happen to work at a company. I'm very fortunate to say that I, I like all of my coworkers. I miss them. I miss the camaraderie. Uh, and I have three kids, 10, 12, and 15. Uh, they're now around all the time. I'm around all them <laughs> at, at the t all the time. So just those types of challenges. Uh, but in terms of uh, itsy ritzy, I think we dealt with our challenges just by adapting. Uh, we we try to maintain a nimble philosophy the rest of the time uh, in preparation for when there might be a crisis. Well, this is what we've been planning for. This is a crisis. Uh, so we, we chose not to make any assumptions. We looked at our entire suite of tools and and uh and strategies uh for figuring out how to uh continue to survive and thrive thank you Adam? yeah for us I, it's kind of been you know i'd say three phases of uh how things have felt as this has unfolded uh you know the first like has already been mentioned the first phase for us i think was kind of wait what's happening and early confusion kind of unknown of how drastic the situation is and how long it might last. Um, did, didn't have a full grasp on the fact that we'd still be home at this point. So just trying to transition to homeschooling and um, you know keeping my other younger kid entertained and uh, trying to keep momentum with work and respecting their entire team just had their lives disrupted at the same time. So just managing the, the human aspect of it was, was a, a certainly an important part of the beginning. Phase two, still parts of that same phase one, but um, you know, kind of managing people's emotions around the situation. Everyone has a different circumstance in terms of their family life or um, you know, what they have going on at home. And then I think people started to transition to getting into that groove of a little bit more of a routine of, okay, we're here, I need to do my job, I need to do it well. Uh, from a business standpoint, we weren't slowing down, we had, from, a, from an operations standpoint, we had people from all teams chipping in on customer support, um, doing things that weren't their normal responsibilities just because everybody had to, to chip in where they could uh, because the volume was ramping up so much. And then uh, another example on not slowing down, we started uh, our first, the production of our first TV commercials 
right around the time that um, that we went home. So over the course of six to eight weeks, we created TV, you know, national TV commercials from start to finish uh, over six to eight weeks. Launched them in in early mid May, and you know, it was a, a giant endeavor for us um, that happened while all this was going on at the same time. And then phase three, I'd say, is kind of where we are now. You know, people have settled in, school has ended. Uh, we have a little bit of more visibility on what a work environment might look like here in the future. Um, there's momentum and optimism about the business just because of the, you know, the quote unquote gold rush. Uh, still a lot of unknowns. Um, and, and there's still just with the events of the country, not just from COVID. Uh, there's been a lot more just kind of human to human conversations uh, amongst our team and with coworkers. It's not just, you know, are you hitting your goals? Fortunately for us, and I'll talk more about it on the other questions, you know, we've been able to hit goals, but that hasn't always been the, the number one thing on people's minds as, uh, you know, these weeks have unfolded. You're on mute, you Dan. Uh, just a quick question again to all of you. So what would your verdict basically be at the end of three months? Because we are at the end of three months. So are you, so overall in terms of the business, the, the future of the business or where the business is today, do you feel the business is stronger and you are more optimistic purely in terms of the business future uh, or less optimistic? So I'll sort of ask each one of you very quickly. So more optimistic, business is stronger or not as much, but business is stronger. I'll, I'll go first. More optimistic, business is much stronger. Uh, in the parts of March and beginning of April, I think we all had the feeling of when is this going to stop? Um, you know, as more people uh, were, went into unemployment, just the unknown of what was going to happen, it just hasn't for us. So um, we're feeling pretty optimistic. We're very optimistic too. Uh, our Q2 has been going very well. Uh, and in the midst of all of this, planned way before we started quarantine, we were planning out launching a new website, which we just launched last Tuesday. So we're hoping that's going to help with conversion rates and give us a platform for building upon. So we're, we're very optimistic. Good. Yeah, and I would agree with them. I am so optimistic about the future. And in so many ways, this has been a real blessing for us and given us a push of things that might have taken years to get done before that we managed to accomplish in a couple of weeks. And it's really improved. Improved is the wrong word, but it's strengthened a lot of relationships with a lot of our customers. Hmm. Great, thank you. Let us move on to the second question now. So I think this is more on the, the consumer and the software trends and the business trends. What are some of the key trends and maybe business shifts that you are essentially seeing in your businesses overall dynamics and the shoppers behavior? And how exactly have you so far responded to these changes or are responding to these changes? I mean, why don't we reverse the order and maybe start with Adam? Uh, we want to start Adam. Sure. Um, so it hasn't been all smooth sailing for us. I'll start with that. We have a portion of our business that is based around tickets and travel and entertainment. So obviously that part, part of our business has been decimated. Um, we also operate a, a, a shopping site for an arm of the VA um, that has had some challenges. Fortunately for us, the success of our core business on govx.com has um, overcome those shortfalls. So we're thankful for that. Um, pretty much all parts of our funnel have just seen great increases on the top of the funnel. Some of it is due to the fact that we pressed ahead with the TV commercials, um, but we're acquiring new members. Again, we're a member-based site. We're acquiring new members at uh, record rates. And then as you shared on one of the earlier slides around new customers, and that's what we're seeing. These, these people aren't just joining, they're actually shopping faster than they have in the past. And that's great for a number of reasons. One, we can spend more, we feel confident spending more because we're getting the return faster. We're also getting them into our, you know, crafted journeys for first time customers, which we know will, if it performs how it traditionally does, will lead to better repeat rates. And we're seeing that already. Um, AOVs have had healthy increases. Uh, we, we were surprised, frankly, when, you know, as this was unfolding in March and April, that, you know, our, our members were still buying 
expensive Garmin watches and Yeti coolers, uh, things that were not necessary. They were <laughs> nice to have. And some of that might for us come down to the types of occupations that we, uh, that our, our members have, and, and there's some security in that. But um, that was a bit surprising. In terms of like paid advertising, we've benefited from all of the same things that others have seen in terms of lower CPMs. Um, but it comes back to the conversion rate. You know, we, we wouldn't have, it wasn't just about cheaper uh, ad buys. It was the fact that these, the, re the return was there. So we never paused. We never pulled back on um, spend. In fact, we increased over what was already an aggressive budget um, because we did, we wanted to take advantage of this, of this as long as we could. And uh, fortunately that, that still happened. Um, you asked me a question the other day about mobile and desktop and what differences we've seen there. Mobile has been and, and it continues to be king uh, for yeah. us, even beyond kind of what industry norms are. But we have seen some shift. The, the, the conversion rate on desktop, the growth has outpaced the growth on mobile conversion mm -hmm. rate. I don't, that hasn't impacted a lot of what we're doing so far just because of the, the percent of our traffic is, is so sizable on mobile. But that's been one other change just as people have um, been less on the move. Thank you, Alan. Do you want to go next? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, you, you have, in fact, mentioned, uh, you know, mobile and people shopping faster. Uh, we're, we're crazy uh, in terms of our percentage of mobile. It's like not, it was 90% when I joined the company over a year ago. So and when you consider that our, our customers, our new parents, they, they don't have a laptop on their lap, they have a child on their lap. So, and, and now uh, in the midst of this, while building a new site, I upgraded my phone. I can shop with my face instead of my thumbprint. So people just expect that faster, better experience. Uh, and that also relates to our, our marketing strategy too. To what extent are we, we gonna look at doing more with text messaging or targeting uh, differently uh, to specific devices? Um, also, the trends in terms of how people are looking at the world, uh, use of the term like essentials to define how we work and, and uh, who can go back. Well, essentials also applies to things that you need for your baby. Uh, and so we created a, a special collection on essentials. Um, and then, you know, hopefully there's the trend of uh, uh, people having a lot of babies in about six months from now, and we're gonna be counting on that too. So, um, but, it, but you know, even that, you know, though I joke it, it, you know, people are gonna be having those babies now and they're gonna be needing to work at home with them and that relates to our content strategy, our social strategy, SEO, everything, how we communicate with uh, a very loyal base of followers. We have over 225,000 followers on Instagram um, and they, they are seeking advice. They need help uh, and they need somebody telling them that they're doing a great job. Great, thanks Lee. Ruth, any thoughts? So the two biggest trends that we've seen um, that impact our business, information has been by far probably the biggest thing where we've had just as, we've always had a large percentage of customers that called and looked to us as a source of information for their basic animal health questions. But that has ramped up a huge amount as more folks are trying to groom their animals from home and um, trying to figure out from a now having a call center working from home, what apps, what tools do you use so you can quickly answer a customer that's calling up and saying, hey, how do I trim my Bichon or, and I didn't say that right, I've got a swollen tooth there, but um, that need for information just exploded. And then our, how we adapt to that is really the key thing in this is that relationship with customers is can we get them the solutions to their problems as quickly as we did before, if not faster. And in some cases, we found we could do it better um, with various folks working from home, sitting at their dinner table, answering questions about chickens or goats or dogs or cats, or whatever the question might be. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other huge um, shift we've seen is the pattern of shopping, where Monday used to be the biggest day by far. Um, nobody really cared about emails on Saturdays or Sundays. Now Saturdays and Sundays are huge days for us. 
And that has changed. Then the other big dramatic change we've seen. Very interesting, Ruth. So again, a question for the three of you. So I think, again, just in the spirit of brainstorming and who knows as to how the future would be. Do you think some of these shifts that you mentioned, and let us talk about this concept of customer experience, right? Engaging with your brand. Now, my question is, do you think the customer's expectation from the businesses that they do business with or where the shop has would fundamentally undergo any change because of the pandemic? I mean, what do they expect from a brand has the expectation that the customer has uh, likely to go any change in terms of the products that they purchase or uh, what do the, the companies even stand for? I, I know, Aaron, you sort of mentioned that while pandemic is one, there is another big crisis. I, I wouldn't say crisis, probably is an understatement. It's probably something which is like almost like a social upheaval which is going on, right? So fundamentally, will it change the customer's expectation from a brand? Would they, would they expect brands to probably uh, uh, take a stand or, or pursue a social cause? Would they, would they really look into, in terms of coming up with a different assortment of uh, products probably, which suit their, uh, as Lee mentioned, uh, because I think the work from home is going to uh, be a norm. I think a lot of people are saying that uh, a substantially higher work from home and uh, with, uh, with new norms, for example, uh, Lee, some of your products. So do you think any anticipate any changes just in the spirit of brainstorming? Well, we did have a brief flirtation with a hand sanitizer product. Um, and it just so happens that we were already creating a hand sanitizer attachment to our diaper bags before any of this happened. And it, it fits mm -hmm. both a hand sanitizer and a set of AirPods. Um, and then uh, we, we, at the last minute, we were like, well, why don't we get our own branded hand sanitizer, not knowing exactly that the world, the whole world was gonna be looking for hand sanitizer. And we had them for a while and then our supplier just fell off the, you know, a cliff. So that was one thing where we, you know, we weren't really looking to capitalize on, on, uh, on the crisis. But I think as we, you know, move forward, uh, our overall strategy is just to, to see how we can help people with, uh, with the existing products that we have. Um, uh, babies are always gonna need pacifiers and teethers and rattles. Um, uh, mothers are always gonna need things to carry all this stuff around in. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see us necessarily shifting to a place where we define our product strategy based on this, mm -hmm. but, um, but I would say it's more about our communication strategy, just as you were saying with regard to this, the, the, our place in the world. Yeah. You, you know, a baseline is I think you don't want to hear tone deaf and be putting out a, you know, a, a broad text message or something when uh, something is happening in the world. And I think that goes back to just being nimble and just being on top of things and communicating with your, your teams and, uh, and recognizing that you might have to ch turn on a dime. There's a lot that's gonna happen in the next six months. We don't know what's happening with COVID yet. We have an election later this year. A lot of things could happen. I can say one thing too, Dan. The, I think one, one thing that's changed maybe a little bit from a customer standpoint is the expectations around shipping. Um, not so much for, for GovX. We, you know, we, we don't we don't have next day shipping. We don't have uh, two day shipping. A lot of what a lot of what we sell is direct is a drop ship. Um, an increasing portion is is inventory we hold, and so we have more control over the timing on the on those deliveries. But even you know, I'm sure we've all experienced it with Amazon and where wherever else you're shopping over these last few months. There's just let I mean I think the importance of I need this tomorrow or two days from now. I think there's a little bit more flexibility on people's understanding that well there's a lot going on right now and it might not be possible to get that whatever I need tomorrow. Um, that's benefited mm -hmm. us just because it's been hard for us to keep up with the shipping side of things in terms of speed. And uh, on the customer support side as well, I I think people are un like a little more understanding of just everybody knows that COVID is happening right now and work and life is disrupted and for the most part people understand that so even questions about where's my order or i need a refund even those i think are dealt a little bit more uh, gently from the consumer side now than they maybe would have been before 
Um, but that doesn't change. Like I mentioned earlier that all, all parts of our teams have been chipping in on customer support because we're trying to maintain our levels of, of uh, service, even though the order, the volume has increased so much. And that's been a key thing for us is if, if we can maintain our already high levels of support in terms of response times and things like that, while we have this volume, we really believe that that's going to have a, a beneficial impact for that second purchase or next time that, you know, the member's considering to buy from us or somebody else. So I think just the, the general um, uh, area of customer support, customers' expectations are a little bit lower on, on delivery times right now, but if you can over achieve on uh, how you're handling the, the, the support requests that do come in, I think it's going to have a long-term impact on, on loyalty. Ruth, any thoughts? Yeah, and I was going to say basically the same thing as Aaron. In terms of the expect expectations that we've seen change, the in the beginning customers were very understanding about hey, it's going to take a little longer to get your order out, um, because like Aaron, we had our marketing team pulling orders, our CFO pulling orders, our kids pulling orders. My kids were up there in the warehouse on the weekends because you know got an um, autoimmune disease, couldn't have them around other folks, but on a Sunday afternoon, my 14 and 19 year old were pulling orders right along with me. Um, and we were still several days behind. Um, what we've seen now is we are caught up better, but um, less, more, I would say customers wanting things to be back to normal and being less understanding about things not being normal, kind of being fed up with a delay on everything. And so we're trying really hard to get back to customers as quickly as possible to get their orders out the same day because there is that sense of, okay, it's been long enough now, let's get things back to normal. Even though the whole world is still crazy, how do we get things back to normal right now? And that's the other thing um, in terms of customers, ex customer expectations, we always do big sales on the holidays and we skipped Memorial Day and let everybody have the day off at Jeffers because everybody was tired. Everybody had been working some sort of seven days a week straight. And so our big 10% off sale we do every Memorial Day, we just skipped, even though it did impact our sales. Um, we knew everybody just needed to take a breath. And it was amazing how many customers emailed us or called us and said, how come you didn't have your sale? But as soon as we said, hey, we needed the, everybody needed a day off. Um, it was like, okay, we get, we get it. Hmm. So. That's, that's, that's a very that's important been... point you have raised, actually, Ruth. Uh, I, I think people are much more appreciating the authentic human face of every brand as well, which I think this pandemic has very clearly sort of brought up. So, yeah, thanks for bringing it up. Let me move on to my next question. And I'd probably start with you again, Ruth, since we... Uh, sorry. Yeah. So, this is my next sort of a question to all of you. What are some of your learnings? If there were the like top three learnings that you had from this, uh, this crisis, what would those top three learnings be? Well, Dan, you, you perfect segue for that. The number one thing I've learned is how important being human and that transparency is. Three days kind of after all this stuff starts, I was on a call with List Track and they were talking about needing to let customers know what was going on. Now I've had probably five hours of sleep in three days. My kid who's home visiting from New York City on spring break is diagnosed with an autoimmune disease and we're suddenly in the hospital and it's just a crazy world. And I took it to heart when they said we needed to let people know what was going on. So I put a letter out that said, hey, this is what happened. Um, you know, we we're extremely blessed that my son was not in New York, that he was home on spring break and um, kind of a heartfelt letter about personally the what was taking place and that I was very thankful. I had a lot of great coworkers that were stepping up and taking care of everything at work. And the response to that was incredible. Um, I've had emails from NFL players, from musicians, from just regular groomers in upstate New York. And I have had, I don't know, one well, guess, 500 emails from customers saying, hey, thanks for sharing your story. Thanks for being a real company. I learned later List Track was saying, hey, no, we just really meant for you to update your shipping times, not your life story. So, <laughs> but what happened is folks started wanting updates and had a friend who was diagnosed with this disease and he, he later um, lost his life to COVID-19. But it got to where every Friday I was posting an update on our website that was a real letter with my real email address about how Jeffers was doing and that 
human relationship really seemed to go a long way because we're really the most real people in the world at Jeffers. Like we have a wonderful 150 people family environment. We all know each other and it, but that gets lost in when you're just doing pay per click. You know, folks don't know that they're dealing with real people. And I think learning for some customers that there is a real Ruth Jeffers and there is a real J.R. Miles and a real Kim K. Hill and having those relationships with those folks has been the biggest takeaway. And in our next catalog that just went to the press last week, we dedicated part of the inside front cover to our friend that we lost to COVID-19. And normally you'd never take selling spaces that is that great for something like that but it was the right thing to do and you know we built a, we're building an even better relationship with a lot of customers so great. and then i guess the other big learning ex experience for us has just been you know assume you are an absolute idiot about everything and don't know anything and just question everything and we have questioned how we do our pricing how we do everything and by i mean how we do our pricing we have a kind of a handwritten spreadsheet we've used for pricing for the last 25 years. And so we're like, okay, is there a better way? And what does the data say? And just trying to really learn from this of, you know, do we have to do it this way? Is there a better way? Because everything has been challenged and it's sometimes easier to change when everything is changing. Great. Do you want to go to the next slide? Sure. Um, just following up on what Ruth just said, really the, the learnings uh, kind of blend on the personal and professional fronts. Uh, I, I remember just a week or two into the whole crisis, I sat down with my wife and kids and we had a discussion where I said to them, you know, living day to day, it's something that's generally not viewed positively by our society. You know, criminals live day to day, people who are, you know, uh, are struggling or living day to day. But if you can learn how to do so in, in a positive way, then it keeps you nimble, it keeps you present, and, and that helps you both in your personal and your professional life. Uh, so uh, I, I think we just, you know, stayed flexible. Uh, I agree with you, Ruth, also. Uh, don't assume anything. Um, uh, don't necessarily listen to the words of advice where you, you you give us the data on these webinars a day and, and it's great stuff, but you know, we're doing, if, if apparel is the closest category to us, we're mm -hmm. doing much better than that. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's saying one thing about, you know, focus on your existing customers, not on uh, getting new customers during this time. I've heard that from other webinars uh, we're doing fine with new customers and existing customers so i think it's just part and parcel of just measure everything find those opportunities stay nimble great thank you adam i have a long list of things i've learned personally and professionally over the last three months but to boil it down to a couple in the sake of time uh, number one people can work remotely i think that's something we've all learned uh if our you know top decision makers at the company six months ago I would have never considered it being okay that people work primarily at home. And then now our, you know, CFO is talking about buying an RV and setting up a RV office and driving around the country. And that's, <laughs> she's the last person that would have uh, suggested working from home prior to this. So that's one. Um, it's been talked about here a little bit too, but just focusing on what matters most, like just time is incredibly precious right now with the balancing of work and life. And a lot of people are working, you know, longer than normal right now. Um, and just, it's, it's, you can't spend your time on things that are, are, are not going to have an impact. So it's having really honest conversations with yourself and with your team about what are you doing? <laughs> do we need to actually do this right now? Is it going to make an impact? Um, and that's been a big thing for us. Just, we've gotten better. It, it, this has forced us to get better at that. And then uh, Lee already said this, but just following the trends you're seeing and being nimble. Um, we, we've made, you know, uh, similar actions in terms of, you know, what's, what's being purchased right now. Uh, how can we do a better job of surfacing those types of items to the top? Um, how can we change our approach on paid marketing? Just being ready to be flexible. And um, we're doing that in, in all parts of our business uh, from, from customer support to marketing to our, our brand relationships. So those are kind of the three things I'd, I'd say. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you very much. And one of the things which 
we personally or i have personally learned to like much like your cfo aaron uh, i never worked from home ever in my life so for me it was a shift but now having sort of done remote working i would think so i wasn't even willing to sort of use the word work from home but remote working <laughs> i think i am sort of enjoying parts of it right i mean and as long i mean the productivity in the company actually has gone up even further and uh, overall i think moving forward that would be one of the things which i would be very seriously considering uh, for the entire team as well right? i mean so essentially that has been a big learning and the second learning for me personally has been this importance of gratitude and thankfulness there is so much to be thankful of for everything right just to per- everyone is safe and healthy that itself is the first thing so those are i think the two of the learnings which i really remain very very grateful for but this has been quite a crisis i'll get to my last question i know we are running probably a little tight on time but uh, i know we have a big group of retail executives join us what is your prognosis for the next few weeks or months and uh, uh, any any advice for them i'll start i mean I, i think it's really hard to give blanket advice because all of our businesses are so different budgets are different uh, it's just everybody's different but um for us i think we're as i was mentioning earlier i think we're seeing now like our, our expectation that this is all going to fall off a cliff and go back to pre um covid you know numbers we don't think that anymore and also because we're getting more comfortable in our work situation at home we're we're starting we're we're definitely dedicating more um you know share of our our thought towards the future and not just you know what do we need to do this week and next week it's what do we need to do uh to maintain this in Q3 to nail Q4 but also bigger things like what do we need in what do we need in 2021 and those types of thoughts were not possible a couple months ago so um at least for me personally it's been a little bit refreshing in these last couple of weeks to start being able to back up a little bit and think about <laughs> what what uh what what lies ahead and not just in the immediate future right rootly i would say track everything that's the biggest advice that we as a company we each other is we're starting to look at everything and along with that not making assumptions but really not knowing what the future would hold and you don't want to bring in too much inventory and then be stuck with inventory um as buying behaviors are changing and trying to figure out if some of those changes we've seen are just little blips that happen one time are we looking at some dynamic shifts in purchasing behavior over the next 3 months and trying to balance that because if you can't measure it it doesn't exist yeah so yeah lee I'm going to sound a little bit like a broken record or a copycat but I'm going to repeat some of those things. I'd say yeah, measure everything, find what works specifically for your business because as I've already said you're going to hear advice about even your segment or something that's closest to it. You're going to hear people say do this, don't do that. Find what works for your business, measure it uh um uh relentlessly and uh um uh just try to find a way to ride this wave because i agree with aaron i don't think the um the new normal is is expanding uh for all of us i think the opportunity is is there and come say the holidays and cyber or cyber week period which who knows maybe it'll be cyber month this year mm-hmm. um it, it uh you know it's just going to continue to grow and we're expecting big things great thank you Uh, i know we have sort of got to the end of the time i have to ask this question sorry to put you guys in a spot so if there was one word defining the last 3 months this experience right this uh, uh, experience that we have all sort of lived through what is that one word that you would use to define the last 3 months purely from a business perspective kind of make it a little easier growth great lee growth anyone here flexible great and i um um not one word but no fear of the red let's travel i'm sorry i couldn't we couldn't no fear of the road let's travel fabulous yeah. fabulous excellent well, excellent well, thank you very much this is this is fantastic advice uh thank you very much for joining us i mean it was a fantastic conversation i really wish we could have continued it forever i know we have a couple of questions 
but let me pass it on to heather heather you want to really just uh, quickly do the wrap up and a couple of other presentations coming up Sure, thank you everyone for staying on. I know we're running a little bit over, but um, I just want to thank Ruth Lee and Aaron for joining us today and sharing your experience. Um, I really found it enjoyable. So, I, and I know our audience is really going to appreciate the lessons that you guys shared with us. Before I let you guys go, there is one question I wanted to ask that came in from Colin. Um, and I feel we can just start with Ruth um, and then Lee and Aaron. If, if and when the government welfare assistance unemployment ends in July, would you anticipate sales growth to be moderate? I don't expect it to change our sales growth because so much of taking care of um, animal needs and your pets is not dependent. Um, there's a lot of studies that have shown that someone will forego having their hair done to take care of their animal screaming needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I don't think it's gonna change us much. I think people are gonna continue to have babies. Our lists are gonna continue to grow. I, I think uh, it, it's, I don't think it impacted us too much uh, to have that check in people's hands. I think they would have bought anyhow. Uh, I mean, we saw a huge spike when the stimulus checks went out, but uh, that was in addition to a military payday. <laughs> and for this is just the fact that our, our audience is, uh, uh, you know, largely government based. It's a, a fairly secure audience. Um, so we don't have that concern right now. Eden, would you like to add anything? Well, I remain very optimistic because as I've seen, I mean, very clearly the retail data shows, Heather, that there is a tremendous amount of pent up demand, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, overall, there is more than $125 billion of pent up demand over the last three months. $125 billion is a huge number. And honestly speaking, even if 20% of them sort of outflows, I think, and where does it sort of flow through? It sort of flows through the online channel because the fact remains that the, the pandemic is still very much there, unfortunately, and people feel a lot more comfortable really shopping online. So I think for the e-commerce part, I don't foresee any, any slowing down, at least for the remainder of this year. And I feel very confident of mentioning this rather bullish statement. So I think, uh, yeah. All right, and then um, I'm gonna take one more question. Yudain, this one's for you. Um, are you seeing any meaningful difference in growth between pure play e-commerce sites versus multi-channel? Is buy online, pick up in store included in your numbers that you presented today? Great question. I, I must say, first of all, I think the, the online retailers, again, just, this is more of an anecdotal evidence, not the actual thing, uh, have been able to adapt quicker, primarily because their entire systems, the business operating systems were sort of uh, uh, sort of set up in a way which really was very conducive and once it got online they really had to scale up that system uh, the physical retail uh, i think with suddenly 70 percent of your sales coming down i mean I, I know ruth probably sort of conveys it very well being a part of the essential supplies as well i mean i think that channel we really had to think about different operating systems right you mentioned about the cloud side pickup and so on and so forth so i think any change and shift during a pandemic continuing is always uh, a little more difficult so I think the operating structures have to be sort of re-evaluated and thought up, while the online part, I think, sort of kept on, uh, kept on increasing and growing. And also it's a question of shifting because the overall, uh, the order size tends to be a lot different when it comes to physical retail stores versus the online stores as well. So which I think, uh, again, uh, uh, in terms of purely the shipping norms, uh, I think the businesses really had to relook at their strategy as well. So that's the, a, a very anecdotal evidence, but that's what I'm seeing. All right, great, thank you everyone. All right, so let me get, um, let's wrap this up. So I just wanted to share some really exciting announcements with you before um, we end today's presentation. But as you can see on your screen, on Thursday, July 9th at 2 p.m., Net Elixir is gonna be joined by the University of Pennsylvania, Professor George Day for our Reimagine Tomorrow series. Professor Day will be discussing why vigilant organizations outperform their vulnerable rivals and how they are navigating the three horizons of turbulence due to the corona chaos. If you're interested in registering, please go to netelixir.com slash experience. Next, on August 13th, Netelixir is thrilled to announce our first holiday readiness summit for retailers called Connecting the Dots. As many of you are aware, the 2020 holiday season is poised to be one of the most unpredictable ones yet. So NetElixir is created in this event to help retailers rethink their approach and innovate in a new way moving forward. This thought-provoking event aims to empower retail industry executives with insights, ideas, and the tools um, to help them make better informed decisions and overcome unforeseen challenges during this difficult holiday season. 
This summit includes strategies and insights for retail executives from our thought leaders, a holiday readiness resources and tools, and the knowledge to build a stronger holiday plan and to seize the opportunities that may arise. As you can see, we have an excellent lineup of speakers to help our retailers connect those dots. Some of our speakers include Professor of Columbia University, Sheena Yanger, um, Google's Director of Agency Sales in North America, Bob Dillon, UPS's Matt Guffey, who is the Regional VP of North America Corporate Sales, and Lenovo's Carl Salvino, who is Executive um, of E-Commerce at Lenovo. So we have a lot in store for you, which you can check on our site. So be one of the 500 retail um, industry leaders on August 13th for this half day virtual summit. There is no charge to attend. We just kindly ask that you make a donation to Net Elixir's Flight Foundation. Learn more about the event and our Flight Foundation by going to netelixir.com slash holiday summit. By the Last way, we just to add on to Heather, a, a little bit of an allure out here. We have an FBI agent coming as well. So uh, I think uh, Ruth may have met him, uh, Robin Dreek. Uh, he was the, yeah. the director of behavioral sciences at FBI. So uh, he is quite amazing. And Ruth is probably searching for his book, as I can see. But anyway, thank you very much, everyone. I think, yeah, that's the book. Excellent. Thank you, Ruth. Thank yeah, you. thank you again to all our panelists and all of our attendees for joining us today. Um, I just wanted to quickly remind everyone that you can um, subscribe to our blogs that are released every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday by going to netelixir.com slash blogs um, for the latest retail analysis updates. And then thank you everyone for joining and staying on. On behalf of Netflix, stay safe and have a fantastic weekend. Thank you very much. A very special sure. thanks again to Ruth, Lee, and Aaron. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks for you. having us. Thank, thank you. you. Take care, everyone.